All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. I'm Michael Boswell. With me tonight is Rick Ramadka. Rick, welcome to the show. How's it going? Thank you for having me. Hey, no problem. I'll tell you what, the uh, to kind of give uh, the folks a little bit of background. Uh, you're here because the, uh, the old six degrees of separation thing. You, we are one degree apart because a friend of yours who plays on your new album that comes out next week was a guest on music night and uh -huh. he played that track that guy being rob bonfilio and it's, it was through rob that you and i got to talking and i listened to your new record better days which folks can go to sodastreammusic.com to get on the 22nd but we'll get to that part uh as i listened to the, to the record thought it was really good and said hey you know let's come out and talk music so uh why don't you to give folks a little bit of background on yourself so that, you know, I, I know I'll end up missing out on something. So go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, it's Soda Star Music. Uh, um, Soda Star Music. Yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, some background on me. Um, I don't know. I like long walks on the beach, uh, candlelight dinners. Um, what else do you want to know? Um, <laughs> I've been no, to I, 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 Dateline. So I, I have uh, uh, I have another band called Maple Mars I've had for a long time. Before that, I had a band called uh, Double Knot Spies and the Visionaries. Um, been doing music most of my life, um, never that successfully, but uh, most of my friends whom I love are, are sort of in the same boat. Um, but uh, I've always had a major passion for it and. Um, I also work in the film business. I'm a sound mixer and a sound designer. Um, and uh, like everything, I you know, I came out to California and just sort of fell into everything. So, um, I mean, that's 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 the quick story. Yeah. Now, is, as far as your sound editing goes, you've won some awards, too. So let's not skip over that. Why don't you tell tell people about well, the well, back yeah, back when I used to do a lot of TV, I was at Warner Brothers, and I, I got lucky enough to work on uh, John Wells' shows. So, you know, uh, he was real hot at the time. So, uh, yeah, ER, Third Watch, The West Wing, those those were all shows. And, yeah, collected some Emmys and some Golden Reels from, from uh, um, some you know, some of the shows that I worked on with him, which was really nice. So three Emmys and three Golden Reels. But, yeah. Um, it seems like ages ago now, so. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, you know, it definitely you know fits high on the resume, though. Yeah, I mean, I started off um, in this business. A friend of mine, Jim Cushionary, got me into the business uh, way back um, in the uh, early to mid-90s, um, and uh, I was working for Saban Entertainment. He had just come over from Canon Films, um, and he was working in post-production. I was learning music editing there, and... Um, and I started writing songs for the Power Rangers. That's how I sort of segued my way into the, the whole uh, um, um, entertainment industry. And then, uh, you know, through that, I got a lot of contacts. So I, I always had placements for my songs, which is probably most one of the reasons why I've continued doing music. You know, no matter what, um, I'm always recording because I've always had an outlet at least to get my songs placed either in a commercial or a, or a film or a TV show. So. All right. We'll tell you what, we've already got a uh, comment here from uh, James who says, nice Beatles candlestick poster, Rick. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, got that at the um, Pasadena, Pasadena uh, city college flea market that happens, <laughs> that happens every uh I got that one. I got a bunch of cool ones. Um, yeah. I got this one too. Oh, very <laughs> cool. You can't very go wrong with John Petty. Yeah, I got I got a bunch of stuff here. Um, um, yeah, there's a. That's my little go-to. I mean, I I like to go to these places, you know, record stores and flea markets when I when I have the time. And the problem with flea markets is, you know, you have to walk. A distance from your car you can only carry back so much so you know mm -hmm. I, I usually have a stack of albums um uh I usually go with my friend michelle natty and then you know we uh uh i just start hunting down albums and posters and everything else and i just find a place for it in my studio 
what was the last you know find, if you will, for albums? Um, John Entwistle. Oh, okay. Whistle Rhymes. This is an amazing record. Um, matter of fact, uh, I do these treehouse sessions from time to time, right? Where I, you know, I do some covers in my treehouse. I'm going to do a, a track from this album probably next week <clears throat> um, called Thinking It Over, which which is about a guy that's – it's an amazing song. It's it's a waltz feel, three, four times signature, and it's about a guy who's on the ledge ready to jump after his, uh, his wife – left him for another man and took the kids in the car and half of the house. Um, just related to me. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, that's a, it's, that's a great album. And anybody that knows John at Whistle, um, it's either that or his first album is, are, are the, you know, the, the, a favorite of, of theirs. Yeah. So if they're into um, solo, you know, who players, definitely. What? Tell tell me this out of you know obviously you're like me you're you're collecting albums and you know, any any kind of music memorabilia. What is like the crown jewel of your collection? You know I, you know somebody asked me the same thing about instruments. I don't own anything really expensive uh, guitar wise, and my record collection is right there. You can see it. It's I mean I don't have that many. Most of the albums I had when it, when I was a kid are gone. I don't know what my mother did with them, but. Uh, I'm still trying to track those down, but um, I'm slowly rebuilding my collection. Um, I don't have, you know, um, anything really. Well, if if I have something uh, valuable, I probably don't know it because uh, I'll go into these record stores and I'll try to find like, you know, uh, first edition, whatever, great band in, in good condition. I have no idea what that stuff's worth. Um, I will buy reissues from time to time, but not the big massive box sets because um, I also have two little kids that I'm raising and, uh, you know, it just gets, it gets too expensive. So, um, but, you know, I have, uh, I have the new Sgt. Peppers, the new White Album, the, the re, uh, remixes, but those aren't worth, you know, uh, they're not like collector's items per se, but, um, um a Holly's, uh, um, what is it? Uh, Hypno um, help me out here. Hyp Hyp Hypnosis, is that the name of the? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, I think so. Um, and uh, Yard, Yard Birds reissue. But other than that, I don't, you know, I'm just trying to build my collection. I'm lucky if I have a thousand albums over there. So, you know, it's all my friends put me to shame, all, all my record collector friends. Yeah, well, you know what though, for you know, for me, it's not about the you know the the dollar value of the item. Right. It's about the intrinsic value of what that album means to me, or what that whatever you know the collectible you know poster, whatever it might be. You know, yeah. you know, it's funny. I remember uh, years ago, before I started collecting vinyl again, <clears throat> I had some CDs. I didn't have a ton of CDs, and, and a friend of mine, um, music friend. Uh, Brian Thomas actually came to my house for a party and he walked in and he's like, where's all your records? <laughs> because he just assumed because I was a songwriter, you know, all of us have like huge collections. I mean, that's how we, you know, we rip everybody off. <laughs> if you listen to enough records, you learn how to do it. Right. So, right. Um, but uh, I was just like, yeah, I, don't, I, I had records. I don't have any right now. And, and I was just sort of in between. It was, during that CD time, and and uh, I didn't ha even have a ton of CDs. It's just, um, um, I don't know. I, I have I haven't really done that much collecting, but now I am. I'm I'm trying to. Now it's just a question of getting out there and, and getting getting the records. What What would be your your holy grail album? Ah, uh, God. I mean, I think I already have it. I've got like you know, Sergeant Pepper's and, and Pet Sounds are my two top albums, I guess. Um, Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road. Uh, I'm a big Elton John fan. I'm a big Who fan. I have sell out. Actually, I don't have sell out on vinyl. I don't believe I got to get se sell out on vinyl, as well as a quick one. I have Tommy. Um, um, there's. I, I mean, I'm just going right off the top of my head. The very, uh, you know, top yeah. of the list. My the first pa Partridge Family I ever owned. I have now uh, with I think I love you. Um, that was the first song when i was a kid that that i uh i couldn't get out of my head um 
And, what was the first uh, 45 that you, you, you got as a kid? Hair. I, 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 I just talked about this on another interview I did. Hair was the first, by the cow sills, was the first 45 I ever owned. I think my mom bought it for me, and I played it about 15 times in a row. I was just so blown away by that song. And, and I had requested it because it was on the radio at the time. And so, um, um, yeah, she brought it home, and, and, um, and I, couldn't, I couldn't stop listening to that. I think the first LPs, like real LPs, that I, uh, that I ever had, I got for Christmas, and I believe it was like Chicago with um, uh, Make Me Smile. I forget, was that Chicago? I don't know what number that was. It was the Gray album. And uh, and let it right, be. Right. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. And let so, it be. But yeah. and, and it was already after the Beatles had broken up. Um, but let it be was the first Beatle album I ever had. Um, and I think my mom did have Sergeant Pepper's because I remember hearing. Um, I remember uh, being um, really uh, blown away by uh, several tracks uh, on on Sergeant Pepper, but. Um, um, God, I'm, Benefit of Mr. Kite and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. That's, you know, the the Mellotron in that song just would always get me. Um, but I believe I didn't own that record yet. I think I think my mother had it. So, okay. Yeah. Tell you, tell you what, we got a note here from Scott Robbins who says, Yo, Ricky, let's do a live Facebook performance. <laughs> so we got, we got, got your first call out on the... Uh, I'm doing it now. <laughs> 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 I haven't done any live Facebook performances, and, and there's a good reason for that because I'm, it's it's uh, I like to I like to post the videos. I'm starting to find out through this pandemic, especially that people are going to watch things when they want to watch it. You know, everyone's on their own schedule now. Everybody's home. To get people to watch something at a specific time, I find is really really hard. Um, so my biggest fear is I, I do I. I do all this rehearsal and I get up all these songs and I get ready and there's two people watching, you know, um, and cause you can see, and that'll, that'll affect my performance and I'll be like, Oh, Oh God. All right. You know? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons, but, uh, um, you know, I don't care about making mis a mistake. I make mistakes all the time when I play live. That's, that's not a big deal, but, um, um, it keeps yeah. it real. It keeps it real, definitely. And, and you know, I, I was watching a Graham Nash. Uh, Graham Nash was doing, uh, I think it was Our House or, um, yeah, on the piano. He did a lot, and he screwed. He screwed up, and, and he just looks at the camera and he goes, "The piano, like, <laughs> like, yeah." There's, there's white and black keys. It's, it's all too confusing, you know. <laughs> Which I can relate to because I play a little piano, but I'm, I'm really bad. So, yeah. Hey, we got another uh, shout out here from Kurt. Kurt Vance says uh, says hey to you, to you and I. So, Kurt, thanks for tuning in. Hey, Kurt, how's it going? Um, yeah, you know, a lot. Of, it's, it, it's funny because um, um, you know, just pushing this album before the the actual release has been really cool. I've been getting a lot of airplay, which has been really nice. And you know, I like the fact that um, uh, we live in a time now where where a lot of this college radio and internet radio, they're happy with digital files. So no more packaging CDs and, and going to the post office and, 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 you know, then sending them an email. Did you get my CD? You know, um, I, I, I like the fact that um, I was, I've been able to do a lot more pre promotion before the actual release because of the, the di digital world we live in now. It's so well, much uh, easier. Speaking of pre promotion, promotion, why don't we get into the to the album itself? Now, one of the things is, you know, the, the it struck me immediately uh, uh, is the production on it. The production is excellent, and so when you said that you know Pet Sounds and Sgt. Pepper were you know two of your you know biggest uh, albums, you know it, I, I can see why. You know, uh, right. you, you managed to create a very full sound without having it be overwhelming you know uh, sometimes it you know the record sounds muddy or what have you but yours is very crisp nice full but everything is very distinguished so when when you go into the studio what approach do you use i mean you know i just 
I just use my ears. You know, I'm a sound mix. I, I, I you know, work on feature films. I, I do sound design. So, uh, you know, I've been using my ears for a long time and it's all about frequencies and, and just trying to, I'm pretty good at mimicking um, what I want. So I can listen to a song and, and, and sort of mimic where the instruments are placed, but I, I don't even do that with my stuff. I just, you know, it's like, for me, it's like throwing paint on a canvas. And then, and then when it comes time to mix it, um, <clears throat> I just want to make sure all the colors are, are vibrant and everything is shining the way it should. And, um, and you know, the biggest mistake I hear with, with a lot of songs is some people will put some, some cool parts in, you know, whether it be an instrumental part or something, or even maybe a background vocal. And they're really, really nice little parts. But for some reason, sometimes in the mix, they will just put it so far back that it's like why? Why did you even bother having it in there? I feel like if you, if you're gonna, um, obviously sometimes you can't feature everything all at once, but but it's all about picking and choosing and balances and and um, and uh, if you're gonna come up with an idea, feature it, you know, um, run with it. So um, I mean that's the only explanation I have other than that, and and I just try to uh, you know I have some. Decent speakers are not amazing speakers. I know my room well. Half half of it is just knowing your room and knowing where. If you have bass issues in certain areas, or or you know how how EQ your room actually is, and if you take mixes out of your room and you play them in your car, do they sound drastically different? Or are they are they pretty close? You know, it's all about um, trusting your ears, really. Yeah. Well, the. Uh now, folks, can I mean, we shared it on uh, on Music Night? But there's a trailer that gives everybody a little bit of a snippet of all the different songs on there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that I suggest everybody go check it out. Uh, you know, on better days, you've got a nice variety of songs. Uh -huh. song, it has a distinct texture to it. Yeah. Uh, when you go into write, are you uh, a writer who? draws on real life experiences are you like a fiction writer are you a little bit of both do you start with lyric do you start with you know, with a good groove what's your approach to songwriting this is this is this is what i'm best at pontificating on creativity <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's it's the one question most most um djs ask and, and it's a great question because everybody does sort of have a different way of doing it um but I find the more interviews that I listen to, I find um, there is a there is a connection in that a lot of people like like myself, we just sort of mess around on whatever instrument we're we're messing around on, whether it be the piano or the guitar, and and you wait for something to pop out, you know. And if it pops out, I, I grab my phone um, and I uh, I record a snippet of it uh, as much as I've I've got um, into my notes. <clears throat> and um, if it's something that's really exciting, I'll keep going and try to come up with a verse uh, or a chorus um, and, and or I'll have another idea. And then sometimes I, I'll listen back to these little ideas and I'll put them together to create a song. Um, and, and every now and then I'll get a lyric first. But usually I don't I don't do the lyrics first. The lyrics usually comes come after I've written the melody. So um, um I've, I had a lot of ideas for, for uh, lyrics for this album. Um, and so, some of the ideas I did think of prior to, to, um, to writing the melodies. But uh, for the most part, um, you know, it's like everything. It's like fishing. You know, you, you cast the line in, you hope you catch a fish. You know, that's, that's all you can do. Yeah, I'll tell you what, we got a, we got a question from John who uh, asked, how long did it take to put Better Days together? Oh, well, it took uh, it took about a year and a half, I'd say, because, you know, I enlisted. All right. So so this is my second solo album. My first one is called Tripping Dinosaurs. Uh, that one, I played all the instruments myself, including drums, because um, I started on drums when I was a kid. Um, and I did it as an exercise because I'm a big fan of, you know, Emmett Rhodes and Prince and McCartney and Todd Rudgren and all, all these great artists that that self-produce and, and can you know, they know their way around a studio and, and they use it as an instrument. And so, um, um, I, I wanted to try it and 
see how it would come out. This time around, I wanted to do it 180 degrees uh, the opposite way, which is to do as little as possible and, and, and enlist all my friends that um, I've, I've respected and either A, wanted to be in the band with or just I've seen them play many times and I envied their, you know, their talent. And, and, um, and so that was the whole point of, of getting all the, the guest people on, on this album. Uh, and it took a while because I was asking people, Hey, do you want to play on my record? And, you know, and I would make these demos and I would send them off to, you know, four or five people per song sometimes. And, and, um, and, and say, Hey, you know, do you think you can add to this? You know, what would you, you know, here, here it is. And then sometimes they get right back to me. Some, sometimes it would take a while. Uh, Ron Bonfiglio bon is a, is quite a busy uh, musician. Uh, it took him a while to get back, but what he sent me was, was absolutely amazing. And, and, and as was pretty much all the tracks I got from everybody. I mean, it was like, I say in the liner notes, you know, on the album that every time I got a track back, it was like Christmas because I would, I'd open the file and I'd, I'd put it up um, with what I had recorded at that point, and um, it was everything would just fit right in. It was it was really really nice. So um, that's probably why it took as long as it did because it was um, you know once once I got the ball rolling and, and the songs kept going, it was I was like this is a great process. I'm not going to rush it, and. Um, and that's that. I mean, the album's been done actually um, for quite a while. I just waited because of the pandemic. I I, I, I held off on releasing it, and then um, and then I figured the world's not going to get any better, so <laughs> I might as well release it now. Yeah, out there, bring, bring a little of, uh, joy to some folks. Ex yeah, yeah, ex exactly. It's like um, you know, better now than you know, better better late than never, right? Exactly. I'll tell you what, we got another uh, comment. I'm thinking this one is a completely unsolicited, no connection to you whatsoever. Uh, Mike Umadka writes in and says, your viewers and listeners are in for a treat. Better Days is a fantastic record, especially the track Full Bone Freak Out. That's my knucklehead brother wanting me to play, <laughs> wanting me to play that song because he played drums on it. <laughs> I had a that was the thing. I, I remember you know, seeing the, the liner notes and I had a feeling that's what it was. So, no, he, he did a but, great job. Mike, I like that record, actually. So. No, he did a great job. Um, uh, Wally Farkas is on that song as well. He, he does some amazing background vocals and, and some nice guitars uh, in some spots in the choruses. And, um, um, yeah, that was a full-blown freakout. That was a um, – that, that one I wrote around the lyric, the, the title, actually, because I was um, – I was working um, at DreamWorks on this project <clears throat> and the director, we were actually shooting ADR, uh, group ADR, where you have a bunch of uh, people doing background voices. And um, I was looking at the script he had and he had a very, very cacophonous scene where it was just chaotic, people talking all over each other. And, and, and for the, he, he just titled that, that area, full blown freak out. And I was just like, that's that's like a song title, you know. And I was like, I told him, I said, I'm going to write a song out of that, and and I did. So well, you know what? The, the uh, it's not the first time like an offhand comment or some you know obscure thing will turn into something. Yeah, I mean, like I said, they come. It comes both ways. It's like it's every now and then I'll start with a lyric, um, and then um, and or. You know the the musical part comes, but then I'll, I'll I'll slap that lyric on there. You know I'll I'll look through my little note. Oh yeah, there's that lyric. I forgot about that. You know, and then uh, I mean, like I said, it, I think it's the same for a lot of writers. They they all seem to, you know, I, I I found it really interesting how Elton John would do it with Bernie Taupin. You know, Bernie would give him the the, the lyrics, and he'd just sit it in front of the piano, and within five minutes, he, you know, but you know those lyrics would actually almost move his fingers it was it was insane how how quickly uh maybe five not five minutes but 20 minutes i mean i mean he was uh quite gifted when it came to interpreting interpreting um bernie's vibe behind the words he was coming up with you know i i think he was 
beyond genius when it comes to that, you know, to be able to take a lyric and just know exactly where it should go musically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the there are songwriting teams, if you will, where it just clicks. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Burt Backrack, Hal David. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, when you, you look at the body of work, you know, Bernie and Elton, this is like, wow, yeah. all of that, and it's just amazing, you know? Yep, now, definitely. who who would you, like, when, when at what point did you decide that you wanted to write songs, and when you did start, who were, like, your big influences where you said, you know what, I'm going to either try to write something like them, or at least send you in that, that vein? Um... Let's see when I first start. Well, I mean, I, I I'd probably go back to the uh, to the late '80s. You know, um, I remember remember I I would very much copy XTC and the replacements, Paul Westerberg. Um, yeah, that was that was a thing for me. Matter of fact, I almost ruined my voice trying to sing like Paul Westerberg <laughs> because he had that raspy quality and and and. You know, it took me years to figure out what my real voice sounded like because I was so busy mimicking everybody. Um, and I know my voice really well now. Um, I know my limitations. I know what I can do on any on a good night. I know what, what I can do on a bad night. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of that is just experience. You just, you know, you start there. That's a starting point. But I ended up falling back um, stylistically on the stuff that I grew up with, with which is Everybody from from Led Zeppelin to The Who to Thin Lizzy to Aerosmith to a lot of pop, a lot of AM pop, Pilot. You know, I mean, you know, um, I, I was a big fan of just hit hit radio AM pop songs. You know, um, and the sugary, the better. You know, the yeah. more bubblegum, the better. I mean, so it was weird. I had two sides. I had a sugary bubblegum pop side, and then I had this this rock and roll side. And then I actually got got into Prague. Uh, I was in the Prague and uh, and even some uh, jazz for a while. The jazz thing, I I, I sort of let go. Um, uh, I it was during the time when I went to GIT Guitar Institute of Technology in in Hollywood. Um, there was a lot of guys. Uh, most of the people there were in the jazz. So you know, mm -hmm. I was in the jazz for a while. Yeah. Well, tell you what, we got uh, a question here from Kurt, uh, who does the Power Pop Overdose uh, Ghost. Don't want to sound like I'm uh, drinking, you know, here. But he wants to know what's in your glass. Um, this is straight vodka that I'm drinking out of here. <laughs> no, uh, it's just water. Um, I will be drinking beer later when I watch the Clippers try to clinch the uh, uh, game seven uh, of the NBA playoffs. I'm, I'm a huge basketball fan, so uh, I'm saving my my brain cells for for when I watch the game. Actually, probably beginning after this interview, but. Um, uh, well, actually, you're you're over in Chicago, right? Correct. Yeah. So we, we don't have a playoff team uh, this year in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. You guys haven't had uh, a team for quite a while. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So, but but when we were good, we were good. Yeah. No. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. The Last Dance. You got. You have to watch the Last Dance. Oh well, yeah. I've already seen it, and yep. it's yeah, great. Brought back really a lot fun. of memories. So, Definitely. but. Uh, uh, Scott has uh, jumped in here again, saying the vocals and melodies are off the charts. It is easy to listen to. I agree completely with him. Uh, what tracks on the album are the the ones that you know you look? Yeah, you, know, you listen to it now. First of all, well, actually, I should say, are you somebody who once the album's done, you don't listen to your stuff for a while? You need some distance, or do you you know sit through it and kind of? Go, oh, I wish I would have done this, or wow, I'm really proud of that. I shouldn't have done this, or second guess some things. How, what's, yeah. what's your approach to it? Nope, once it's done, it's done. Um, I mean, once it's done and mastered, I, it's done. I don't, I don't listen to it anymore. Um, I've listened to it enough. Um, the only time I listen to it a lot is if I'm checking out a radio show where they're playing it. Sometimes I'll listen to it and I'll be like, oh, it sounds good over the internet, or you know, I'll start. Mm -hmm. uh, Look, listening on a technical level, actually, um, am I hearing the kick drum enough? You know, it's you know stuff, little things like that. But um, um, also, when I, like I just did a video for a song called "The Ever After," which is on the album, which is probably one of my favorite songs on the album. And um, so that one, 
uh, I actually enlisted my uh, my little girl, uh, Layla, who's 11, who also sings uh, in, on uh, the title track, Better Days. And um, um, she even told me, she's like, I'm sick of that song because we, we had <laughs> we, we had shot this video in the treehouse and we did it over and over and she was working the camera and, <clears throat> you know, so she heard it a million times that day. And then um, I was editing the video in my, my studio here and, she walked in one night. She's like, "Oh, I'm so sick of that song." <laughs> so, so you know, I get it. You know, yeah. you can. You definitely, um, you know, I mean, I there's some amazing tunes. Uh, I mean, God only knows uh, is one of my all time favorite songs. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if I'm listening to Pandora, I listen to Pandora in my car. Uh, if it comes on, I'll pass it. I've heard it a million times. I love it. I don't need to hear it again. Um, uh, but that being said, um, depending on my mood, I may stop and listen to it and just, you know, fall in love with it all over again. You know? Um, yeah. It's, it's like anything else. It's like, uh, dare I say too much pizza could, could be, uh, could be, you <laughs> know, no a turn off at some point. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's like you get to a certain point and you want to just, you know, move on. Right. Um, I, I'm I'm okay not doing any more new music for a while because uh, uh, I have this album and I'm also just completing a, a new Maple Mars album, which is my band. And um, so half of the songs that I wrote during this writing stretch was for Maple Mars and half was for the solo album. So I would literally, as I was writing them, I'd have to figure out, okay, which band would, would this be better for? And so I actually brought a couple of songs to Maple Mars that they passed on that are now on on this on this better album. Days. not better days uh um let me see searchlight they were like yeah searchlight's a good is a good track i can't it's believe it's a great song that. i think they made a mistake <laughs> but that <laughs> song is is you know it's not quite maple the maple mars stuff is a little more psychedelic so i i get that you know that one's a little more, more straight ahead although the, the bridge is very psychedelic but um yeah, they're they're just uh, you know with, with the solo stuff. I don't think so much about style. I just let it let it fly. Whereas with Maple Mars, I kind of lean more towards the psychedelic thing because that's sort of the vibe of that band. It's like a rock psychedelic thing. So um, yeah. I, I try to stay, um, you know, keep keep the uh, the overall aura of that of that sound. All so, right. <laughs> or is make no sound, but you know what I mean. The vibe. Yeah, we know what you mean. Right. Well, you we're actually at, at our uh, 30, uh, 30 minutes here. I want to make sure that, uh, uh, let, again, let everybody know where they can get the album, where they can you know hear that trailer for it, and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, Better Days um, is the name of the, the album. It, you can um, The trailer is on, on the website, which is uh, sodastarmusic.com. And um, um, there's also a video that we just shot, which uh, actually I, I shouldn't say that we shot it a year ago, but I just I just uh, released this video called I'm Here to en Entertain, which is the beginning of side two, I believe, and um, uh, about a sad clown in a circus. And um, that's also on, uh, you can also see that video uh, at uh, sodastarmusic.com. All right, sounds good. Well, I want to thank everybody who uh, wrote in, Scott and Kurt and Mike and James and John. And yeah, I apologize if I missed anybody there. But uh, Rick, thank you very much for, for for being our guest here on the show. I enjoyed the conversation. Well, I, I really appreciate it. this. This is a first for me. I, I haven't done any of these live interviews on camera, which is nice. I actually did shower, although I am sweating because the... the <laughs> Um, I had <laughs> I had my my windows shut to shut out the outside noise, and now I'm uh, you know I'm gonna go jump in my pool. I think now. <laughs> yeah. Well, don't worry. No, nobody can can, can uh, smell you. You know, on, uh, on the <laughs> <laughs> nor would they want to. <laughs> no, I really appreciate uh, you you had me on, and and uh, um, the guests that you told me you have coming on, I, I feel honored that you had me on because you have some really great guests in the, in the coming weeks. And I hope people tune in because um, I, I'll be tuning in for sure. I want to see some of these guests. I appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. So, 
All right. Well, once again, we've had it across the, the bottom of the screen for most of the show telling you where that you can uh, get better days. You know, I, I'm pretty picky and I like the album quite a bit. So thank uh, you very much, Michael. I appreciate that. Not a problem. Sounds good. Hey, everybody. Thank you much for, uh, for tuning in and uh, hope you'll come, come around for the next time. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.